Välkommen till senare samtal. Välkommen till Världskulturmuseet. Välkommen till senare samtal igen. Arrangerade Göteborgs litteraturhus. Mitt namn är Jesper Brygger och här har ni min fantastiska kollega Sofia Gräsberg. Det är vi som har gjort det här. Tillsammans med så många andra. Och tack till dem. Litteraturen är på samma gång stark och sårbar. På vilket sätt kan denna sårbarhet och denna styrka hjälpa oss att förstå och motarbeta rasismens verkningar? Vilken roll kan litteraturen spela här och nu? Dessa frågor har varit brännande aktuella i arbetet med programläggningen av dessa scener och samtal. Det är också frågor vi är tillsammans om här idag och allihopa ska försöka hitta ett flertal av svar på. Ja, nu är det bara det sista eh, lilla välkommen för mig också kvar. Välkommen. Och välkommen Tove Folkestan, Alexandrina Chamberlain och Troy, Harald Dutty Roy. Vi ska få lyssna på ett väldigt kärleksfullt samtal om hur litteraturen kan skapa världar och om gränslös solidaritet. Det behöver vi höra, tror jag. Så varmt välkomna och warming welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Is the mic on? Okay. This one of these Madonna microphones, and it makes me always a bit nervous, but <laughs> it'll be fine. Um, I want to begin by addressing what is going on today. That uh, there's this big uh, Nazi march, and also this big resistance and anti-demonstration, anti-Nazi demonstration um, that I hope many will be attending, and many will be attending perhaps after this as well. Um, but we want to also get into how writing can be, what writing's role is in resistance and in politics. Um, often, as a writer myself, I think about like, oh, it's just words, I should be, you know, just politically organizing instead, and then other days I think, ah, oh, the pen is mightier than the sword, so, you know, this is really strong resistance, and then I keep doubting myself back and forth. So what I want to ask you is, um, what role do you believe that writing and writers can have in political resistance and uh, political change? Well, firstly, let me say that I'm extremely proud to be here. And I think it's a moment, this moment in time, these coordinates are telling us how important it is for literature and for all kinds of politics, you know, the deepest, most eternal kind of politics and the politics that is overtaking the world like a convulsion today, to meet at this point, right now, at this moment. Uh, you know, we, we know that writers are not uh, beings that are separate from other people, you know. There are writers who have in history supported the worst kinds of things. So they are like plumbers, you know, some fix the cisterns of the fascists, some walk a different path. So uh, it's difficult to really define what the role of writing or writers is, but I think um, there would be no politics if everybody was only fighting on the streets. There would be no politics if we were just writing only manifestos. Uh, the, the, the place of art, of literature, in, un, in attempting to, we will never fully understand anything, but in attempting to understand not just the surface of things, but the heart of things, 
the politics that is inside love as well as the politics that's inside parliament and everything in between. Uh, I feel somehow, you know, that, that it is extraordinary in a world where we have so much internet, filmmaking, Twitter, documentaries, so much, and yet people look to literature to do something that nothing else can do. They look to fiction sometimes to, 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 to do what nothing else can do. And, and I think that is a role that we, we must understand deeply. Yeah, you, you said uh, the other day when we were talking, you said that um, we talked about how can we be here talking about your novel, listening to literature, should we be out on the street doing this manifestation that is also important. And you said, we are going to be here because we militantly believe in art. Mm. So I think that's worth to repeat. And I think that's why most of you are here also, that we believe in art. And yeah, we believe, uh, we militantly believe in art. We militantly believe that those Nazis marching out there are marching from the frustration that they know that they can never be as beautiful as us. <laughs> never. <laughs> yes. And for me, personally, this is a, a huge honor to meet you and to talk with you and share my... Same. <laughs> I think it's the same. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm honored <laughs> too. <laughs> Actually, really, we met and got to know each other by the passion for your writing, and you know that. And. Um, <laughs> When I grew up, I didn't know much about art, uh, but actually I grew up with a lot of fear. And uh, my sisters and I and our mother, we were inventing like a way to protect ourselves and a way to uh, survive childhood, I think, by inventing uh, language where you could like repeat an insultment time after time until it sounded really funny, you know? And we, we could dance uh, through the histories and through the language a lot by playing with it and shifting the authority that way. And when I read your first novel, uh, it was maybe 15 years ago, uh, and I had never thought about being a writer, I just read the novel and I couldn't stop reading it. So I kept reading it. When I was on the last page, I kept reading it from the first page because there was something in there that I really, really felt at home with. And it was this language that you let Esther and Rahel, they play with everything so it becomes um, bearable, I think. And they can... Um, so I started uh, writing and actually I didn't tell you before, but I told the whole newspaper this morning, like Nogas Nyete, that I put a photo, like your, you know, the photo of the writer in the back. I put it on my computer screen. <laughs> and I had it there, and I wrote. And you know, I got into this, no, what's the point of writing? What's the point of doing this, you know? And I shut down the document, and then you were there. <laughs> Every time you were there with your eyes looking at me. It's like, okay, I opened the document again. <laughs> so, of course, I made you into some, some deity, like a, like a goddess, maybe the storyteller archetype. Un untrustworthy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because storytellers have to be untrustworthy. I know that. I have them in my family. Also. But you were there, and it, it was, you know, and now I'm meeting you, and you're becoming human, you're becoming a friend, a colleague, and it's so beautiful. And it's such an honor to have you here. Thank you. <laughs> and I really want to ask you, what was there anything that made you believe that there is meaning in writing? Uh, that there, you know, that what one that made you want to become a writer? Well, uh, you know, I think uh, as many who might sort of understand from reading *The God of Small Things*. I grew, I mean, I grew up in a, in India, a country which, which lives in a very strict grid 
you know, everyone, tourists look at India and see anarchy, but the anarchy is only in the traffic. Society lives in an iron grid of caste, of ethnicity, of religion, and so on. And, and my mother comes from a very small community of people in the south of India called Syrian Christians, and, and she married outside, then divorced, and then came back to the village. So she was, and we were permanently ostracized, you know, to the extent of people just saying, why don't you go away, and this is not, this is not your home, and this is not your place, and no one's going to marry, all that, when you're very small. And I think because it was a rural area, I spent a lot of my time on the river, catching fish or pretending to catch fish from the age of three or so. I knew every insect and beetle and bug there. And it was a peculiar space, you know. It was not that I was like oppressed, uh, like let's say the untouchable castes are and who live at the bottom. It's not, I, it's just that you were not anywhere, you know. And that was a way of looking from the outside and trying to understand what it was. And of course there was the additional pleasures of having a Australian missionary teacher who Every day would tell me, I can see Satan in your eyes. <laughs> so, so uh, there was the, the, the need to try and um, understand things. I mean, my mother was, my mother was uh, very interesting, but a violent person, you know, and she was bearing so much violence herself that she, the only people she could take it out on was me and my brother, you know, so there was a violence from her. There. And, 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 and at the age of three, I could understand her violence towards me. So that made me a writer, you know, when you, it's a horrible thing to try and understand why someone is being violent towards you and understand it, not react to it. You know, because I could see what was happening to her. So, writing was a way of, and, and it was not only violence, sometimes there was great love. There was a great teaching too of, you know, you don't need these people, you, you be okay on your own. But then the next day it would be something else, you know, psychotic and crazy, unpredictable. Yeah, so, so, to deal with that unpredictability, I think I started to, I mean, my brother went through the same thing, but he's a seafood broker, you know, so that <laughs> it, does, it doesn't mean, there's no rules here, but I think I started to write when I was very young, and then by the time I was a teenager, nothing was further from my mind than being a writer, because the only thing that mattered was to get out of there, to leave home, to somehow survive, somehow be financially independent. And so for many years, I only thought about money. Like, how am I to make it to the end of the week? How am I to make it to the end of the month? There was no wider ambition, or there was no thought of career, or this is what I want to be, or this is what I dream to be. My dreams were really small and practical, <laughs> you know. And then, of course, uh, I, I, I studied architecture and I was able to start working even while I was in architecture school. And then lots of lucky things happened. I, I got, I got, uh, I mean, someone literally saw me on the street and asked me to act in a movie, <laughs> I, which I never wanted to do, but I thought if I did, I could, uh, you know, I could see how films were made, and, and then I started working in cinema as a writer, as a production designer, and then eventually, so it... I saw one of the films you acted in. Did you? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, this, what is called lunatic fringe cinema. <laughs> yeah. 
but uh, it was you know it was uh, writing writing was the only way to for me to it continues to be the only way to understand what i'm thinking so i've often said language is the skin on my thought so sometimes i wonder whether i have a thought mm -hmm. that i can't express because that's the eternal game in me to be able to uh, i'll tell you a nice story about writing yes. i as you know have um, re you know was very involved with a, a big anti dam movement in india and so on and i was invited to the hague to speak at something called the world water forum which i never do and i never went and then i heard that the indian government was sending a delegation basically to talk about the privatization of water and dam and so on so i just arrived there solely to wreck the proceedings and i was sitting on this panel of people who called themselves writers but they were only writers of privatization policies and water policies and so on and everyone was asked to introduce themselves and say why they wrote about water so the man sitting next to me i don't remember the name properly but he was an american and he said my name is so and so and i write about water because i'm paid to and i just want to say and he says i just want to say that god gave us the rivers but he didn't give us the delivery system that for this we need private enterprise <laughs> so i said well i'm uh, arundhati roy and i write about water because i did paid a great deal not to <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, you know i said well it's been a long time since i've been in a room full of dead people because you people call yourselves writers but writers spend a lifetime trying to close the gap between language and thought and you spend a lifetime trying to devise a language which masks thought so every word you say means the opposite when you say deepening democracy you mean the opposite when you say empowering women you mean the opposite when you say freedom you mean the opposite when you say you want to deliver things to the poor you mean the opposite so so whatever else you do please don't call yourselves writers <laughs> i i just get so curious about the early writing of yours did you ever show it to anyone uh or was well, it secretly kept no i mean i i i have some of my school notebooks where my my mother started a school which she experimented with me on so <laughs> <laughs> i have all the notebooks where she's yeah well she writes comments like zero out of 10 great so useful yes but did she still do <laughs> she still does that yeah. last last a uh, couple of months ago she called me and said you know I I just went got gone out to buy something and someone said are you Arundhati Roy's mother and I felt as though she had slapped me <laughs> so I said, I said I told her look you know I've grown up now and I only want you to win always like I never want to defeat you <laughs> I want you to win so it's fine but uh uh well the earliest uh, I, the only time i actually sent something to someone was uh, i think i wrote a very uh, a very 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 short story about uh, you know going back home after having uh, you know having just broken all the rules of that society and being just considered somebody who you know who just delegated to the dustbin and uh, So there's a little story about meeting my first teacher who again was telling me how much god hated me and all that and anyway i sent it to uh, granta which was a uh, obviously you know because i didn't know anything about literature but i i had seen these beautiful books and read and and much to my surprise they wrote back and said can you we, re we really liked it but can you make it a little longer 
and I was, you know, like 21, and I said, no, it's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> so it started from there, the yeah. stubbornness. Yeah, wow. Okay, now we're actually going to see a film that you made. Yeah. That is, uh, maybe you want to introduce the film somehow? Well, it's, a, it's just a six-minute film, um, because the Ministry of Utmost Happiness is a pretty strange book. And, uh, you know, any part that I read about or we talk about may not give you an idea of the rest of it. So, some friends of mine, uh, I live in a community of, of sort of militant documentary filmmakers and all kinds of people. So, so everyone got together and decided we would make a six-minute film which sort of, sort of ranges across the landscape of the Ministry of Utmost Happiness. So you get an idea about the landscape and then we can talk about it. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Before I read, I'll just uh, do a little explanation of what I'm going to read. So, uh, the, one of the main characters in the book is a woman called Anju, who's born to a Shia Muslim family in Old Delhi in the 1950s. And uh, she's born as a boy called Aftab, and then realizes that she's a woman and moves into in, in Urdu, uh, they are called hijras, which means a body inside which a holy soul is trapped. And she moves into a household close by in the, in the city of Old Delhi with many others like herself. And then in 2002, she goes to the western state of Gujarat, where our current Prime Minister Narendra Modi was the chief minister at the time. In fact, installed as the chief minister not elected, just a couple of weeks after 9-11 happened. And the Hindu right realized it was its time, it was the time to make its move. Modi belongs to an organization called the RSS, which was founded in the 1920s, openly stating that it believes India is a Hindu nation. Often its ideologues say that the Muslims of India are like the Jews of Germany. And as soon as he became Prime Minister, of course the burners were turned to high and in 2002 there was a massacre that took place. On the modern metropolitan streets of India, thousands of Muslims were massacred. Women were raped, killed, burnt. The police was watching and sometimes participating. It was all on TV. And quite soon after the massacre, Modi announced elections and won them. And is, of course, now the Prime Minister of India, who, when he was asked by Reuters what he felt about what happened in Gujarat, he said, if I was driving a car and I ran over a dog, I'd feel bad. So Anju uh, goes to Gujarat with an old friend of her father's called Zakir Mia and happens to get caught up in this massacre because she's a Muslim, not because she's a hijra, and she escapes because they think it would bring them bad luck, the butchers. And she moves back to Delhi, but is unable to cope with the trauma of what she's been through because she thinks of herself as butcher's luck, you know, as a person who brought the murderers good luck. And she can't live in the place she lived in anymore, with the people she lived with. And so she moves to a graveyard. And really that's where the story of the Ministry of Utmost Happiness begins, where she lives for, for years in the graveyard as a sort of ravaged specter sleeping between the graves, which is, by the way, not a magic realism, because in India, uh, only Muslims and Christians have graveyards, Hindus are cremated, so the graveyards have become ghettos. Uh, in the rise of the right wing. 
And when she moves into the graveyard, it's, uh, I'm just going to read. The, you, you saw the saffron, the saffron people with the swords. These are the people who kill and massacre and lynch people openly on the streets today in India. Their cousins or friends or brothers or whoever are marching here. So this is just Anju moving to the graveyard and beginning to allow herself to think about what happened to her. On her first night in the graveyard, after a quick reconnaissance, Anju placed her Godrej cupboard and her few belongings near her father's Mulakat Ali's grave and unrolled her carpet and bedding between Helen Bajis and Begum Renata Mukta's Madam's grave. All the graves are people that we know already in the book. So Alam Baji is the midwife who delivered Amjo. And Begum Renata Mukta's Madam is a dancer who's in love with India, who travels from Romania at the age of 17 to learn to dance and then dies young. Not surprisingly, Anjum didn't sleep. Not that anyone in the graveyard troubled her. No jinns arrived to make her acquaintance. No ghosts threatened a haunting. The smack addicts at the northern end of the graveyard, shadows just a deeper shade of night, huddled on knolls of hospital waste in a sea of old bandages and used syringes and didn't seem to notice her at all. On the southern side, clots of homeless people sat around fires cooking their meager smoky meals. Stray dogs in better health than the humans sat at a polite distance, waiting politely for scraps. In that setting, Anjum would ordinarily have been in some danger, but her desolation protected her. Unleashed at last from social protocol, it rose up around her in all its majesty, a fort with ramparts, turrets, hidden dungeons and walls that hummed like an approaching mob. She rattled through its gilded chambers like a fugitive absconding from herself. She tried to dismiss the cortege of saffron men with saffron smiles. Saffron, of course, is the color of the Hindu rite. Saffron and a swastika the other way around who pursued her with infant, infants impaled on their saffron tridents, but they would not be dismissed. She, she tried to shut the door on Zakir Mia, lying neatly folded in the middle of the street, like one of his crisp cash birds. He, he's an old man who makes flowers and these little birds out of cash, which are made into garlands for, for marriages. So like one of his crisp cash birds, but he followed her, folded through closed doors and his, on his flying carpet. She tried to forget the way he had looked at her just before the light went out of his eyes, but he wouldn't let her. She tried to tell him that she had fought back bravely as they hauled her off his lifeless body, but she knew very well that she hadn't. She tried to unknow what they had done to all the others, how they had folded the men and unfolded the women, and how eventually they had pulled them apart, <coughs> limb from limb, and set them on fire. But she knew very well that she knew. They, they who? Newton's army deployed to deliver an equal and opposite reaction. So this is a reference to the, in Gujarat, when, when, uh, when, an incident happened which set off his rights. Uh, uh, the, the establishment said there will be an equal and opposite reaction, meaning set the stage for this killing. 30,000 saffron parakeets with steel talons and bloody beaks, all squawking together. Musalman ka Ekistan, Kabristan ya Pakistan. Only one place for the Musalman, the graveyard or Pakistan. Ajub feigning death had lain sprawled over Zakir Mia. But the parakeets, even though they were or pretended to be pure vegetarian, this was the minimum qualification for conscription, tested the breeze with the fastidiousness and proficiency of bloodhounds. And of course they found her 
and 30,000 voices chimed together. I hi Sali Radi Hijra, sister fucking whore Hijra, sister fucking Muslim whore Hijra. But then another voice rose high and anxious. Nahi yaar mat maro, hijro ka marna aft shagund hota hai. Don't kill her brother. Killing hijras brings bad luck. Bad luck. Nothing scared those murderers more than the prospect of bad luck. After all, it was to ward off bad luck that the fingers that gripped the slashing swords and flashing daggers were studded with lucky stones embedded in thick gold rings. It was to ward off bad luck that the wrists wielding iron rods that bludgeoned people to death were festooned with red puja threads lovingly tied by adoring mothers. Having taken all these precautions, what would be the point of willfully courting bad luck? So they stood over her and made her chant their slogans, Bharat Mata Ki Jai, Vande Matram. She did, weeping, shaking, humiliated beyond her worst nightmare. Victory to Mother India, salute the mother. They left her alive, unkilled, unhurt, neither folded nor unfolded, she alone, so that they might be blessed with good fortune. Butcher's luck, that's all she was. And the longer she lived, the more good luck she brought them. She tried to unknow that little detail as she rattled through her private fort, but she failed. She knew very well that she knew very well that she knew very well. The chief minister with cold eyes and a vermilion forehead would go on to win the next elections. And even after the government fell at the center, he won election after election in Gujarat. Some people believed he ought to be held responsible for mass murder, but his voters called him Gujarat Kalalla, Gujarat's beloved. So, Ajum lives in the graveyard like this for many, many, many years, and then she slowly begins to recover. She ro slowly begins to re revive, and then she begins to enclose the graves and build a guest house, in which each room has a grave of its own, of, with a friendly soul buried in it. And the guest house is called the Jannat guest house, which means paradise guest house. And the story goes on. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to ask you a question that ties in to this one. And that is the question of um, that one of the things I find very beautiful in the Ministry of Utmost Happiness is that it, you tell so many, like a multitude of different stories and, and, and weave them together somehow. And this is something I struggle a lot with with my own writing, is that to tell people that I'm not telling a story, I'm telling stories in plural. Um, wh why do you feel that it's so important to tell the plural stories, to tell many stories together in both this book specifically, but also in general in literature? Why, why is it so important to have the space within writing? Well, in, in, in The God of Small Things, at the front of the book is a quote from one of my most favorite writers who died recently called John Berger. He says, never again can a single story be told as though it's the only one. So, you know, after I wrote The God of Small Things and very soon after I became that celebrated sort of prize-winning successful writer, this Hindu nationalist government came to power, did a series of nuclear tests. And I was at the time being, being promoted at the face of this aggressive new India. And I decided I needed to step off that train, you know. And I spent the next 20 years, instead of traveling on the top of the river, walking on the riverbed, fusing myself into the place I live in the place I write about, I argue about, I fight about. And in those years, my universe expanded, you know. I became like a, 
what, like a sedimentary rock, you know, layers and layers gathered in me. And I, I felt very frustrated by a kind of domestication that I feel is seeping in, you know, everything becoming professionalized. So everything has to be a subject. And a novel also is like applying for an NGO grant, you know. Are you writing on caste? Are you writing on gender? Are you a peace NGO? Are you this? This everything is in the air. And everything connects to everything else in a way which was a challenge to me. And I thought, I, I, I mean, of course, you know, the expectation was that I must write The God of Small Things Part 2 or The Son of the God of Small Things. But I thought, let me turn it inside out. And if The God of Small Things is a book about a family with a broken heart, this is about people without families, with shattered hearts, who bring those pieces together and make a mended heart in a graveyard. And it's a novel, I try to think of a novel as a city, you know, where you don't have the luxury of just living in one home, you walk the streets, you get lost, you meet people, and you must know their story. The guard guarding the Honda City poster, not just a guard, he's from somewhere. The crowd is not a crowd. It's people with stories and names who come to the city, who form the city, who unform the city. And can you write a book where walking down the main road or driving past the biggest shopping highway is not a way to know it. You have to spend time in that world. You have to walk down blind alleys. You have to get lost. You have to find yourself. You have to put in some work, you know. It won't just come and sit in your lap and ask to be cuddled, you know. It's a, it's a difficult, but to me, a, 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 you know, it, it was the same with the God of Small Things. And in this book, uh, the idea of writing fiction to me is like constructing a universe and then asking someone you love to walk through it, through it with you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I think time is running so fast. What time is it? It's actually three minutes past our time. Okay. Oh, hi. <laughs> Well, uh, so, uh, I have a million questions. <laughs> so, so I think, yeah, what should we do? <laughs> we, we, we guess. I guess we should end it. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, oh, but no. it'll never end. Yeah, this, no. this book. We go on. It, this book, I only read it twice. Actually, I think I have to read it many, many more times because it's so much in it. I know they have it here if you know. I think you feel like reading it. And uh, yeah, we have many more questions, but uh, we take it another time. Yes. Do you okay. have anything more to say? Just no, I just, I just want to say that the mystery of how, you know, a, a person who grew up in a little village in South India and then did a lot of stuff, but, you know, for me to come here to find people coming to Gothenburg to listen to me will, or anywhere in the world, it's not about me, you know, it's about the mystery and the magic of literature, and those Nazis will never get us. Never. <laughs>